Napoleon in France, it started with inflation. Mussolini in Italy started with inflation. Hitler in Germany started with inflation. Then you take Latin American countries, Chile, Peru, Venezuela. They all started with inflation, which led to currency debasement, which led to social unrest, which led to extreme control and centralized monetary policy. Hey gang, Greg Barron here again. Thanks for joining our channel. We have got some really interesting things to convey to you as our listeners today. And we're going to discuss one of the most honest indicators that you can look at and educate yourself on to prepare yourself for what's coming. Today we're going to talk about something that most people consider very boring, but has major implications on our financial market, and that is the bond market. Additionally, we're going to venture into a little bit of discussion on the current currency issues that we see coming across the board in the news. Everything you see right now is about the devaluation of the currency, how the U.S. dollar is presenting itself on the national stage, and how other countries, including the BRIC nations, are developing their own strategy to not rely so much on the U.S. dollar for the reserve currency and their trading platforms. First, I want to give you a little history lesson again and take you back to 1960 to a gentleman named Bernie Madoff. Most of you remember Bernie Madoff is running one of the biggest and most successful Ponzi schemes that there has been in recent memory. A Ponzi scheme is similar to a pyramid scheme. Now, to give a little definition behind a pyramid scheme, it always requires confidence in the person or the institution that's pulling it off. So Bernie basically has the respectability of his peers. He looks good. He talks a good game. He's a very intelligent man. But the one thing that people rely on is his legitimacy and his confidence that he exudes in what he's trying to sell. So for decades, Bernie lures investors into his scheme basically to offer not really high rates of return, but respectable rates of return. But it only is successful if he can continue to basically lure other investors into the system. And over time, we have this concept called robbing Peter to pay Paul. But a pyramid scheme only continues to operate if you continue to feed the kitty so that the original investors and those below them are constantly being fed by those new investors, or in this case, printing more money so that nobody ever runs out. So that ultimately the concept is nobody ever catches when what's going on and nobody runs out of money. But ultimately what happens? Pyramid schemes end, and typically they end badly. Like all pyramid schemes historically, it requires constant new money coming into the system. But ultimately, there's a finite set of investors that can invest, and this whole system of a shell game runs out of steam, and then what you have is a discovery and a bad failure. So what I said was the ultimate reason a pyramid scheme, or in this case a Ponzi scheme, is successful is because it relies on one major thing, not the underlying structural foundation of how those returns are paid back, but it requires on this thing, confidence. Now I'm gonna circle back to that concept in just a minute, but let's go back to 1971, which many of you can recognize as the date that President Nixon took us off of the gold standard. Now prior to this, the dollar was anchored into a standard. It was anchored into gold. You can touch it, you can feel it, you can exchange it. It was something solid as a standard. Once the dollar was unpegged from gold, then what did we have to rely on is its standard of value. That standard of value was, quite frankly, confidence in the firm faith and backing of the U.S. government. And as long as that confidence is intact, there are more investors to purchase more dollars. That's the basis of our whole system. Now, before you get your panties in a crack and think I'm headed to some form of partisan policy and take a position, I'm really not. I just want to lay the groundwork for really what our dollar and our currency is based upon. And if you take some analogies from a pyramid scheme, then so be it. But the fact is, we are solely relying upon the dollar value and the currency to be based upon the full faith and confidence of the U.S. government. So let's switch gears just a second. And let's talk about something that most people find very boring and banal. That is the bond market. <clears throat> I've got a reason for bringing this up, which I'm going to reveal in just a second. The bond market, as you may or may not know, is totally debt-driven. Now, our whole system is based upon debt, and the bond market is 
three to four times as large as the equity market. As you may or may not know, the stock market fully capitalized today is worth about $30 trillion. The bond market, however, is infinitely bigger than the stock market. Its full capitalization and value is roughly around 130 to $140 trillion. So the bond market is actually quite a bit more boring and mundane to most people. But I'll submit to you that it is far more honest than anything that you hear coming out of Washington. The bond market gives a measure of confidence in our system. The bond market typically is not politicized. The bond market is not partisan. That's why when you review it right now, you see what's called an inverted yield curve. I have mentioned this previously in a video, and almost every recessionary period has been preceded by an inversion of the two to 10 year yield curve. When this inversion occurs, you see the two year yield paying more than the 10 year. Basically what it means is most people out there don't have confidence in the long term yield of the bond market. And what we see recently to add insult to injury is even the two year has been acting incredibly volatile. The bottom line is if the bond market happens to break, it's going to send shock waves through the system. To a great degree, this is taboo to talk about, but it is an incredibly important component of our monetary system and how we are viewed on the international stage. Presently, we're starting to see a few cracks in the system. If you can follow this analogy, it's like a reservoir of water, a great big lake, great big lake full of debt, and you've got this dam holding it in. The problem is there are structural weaknesses in the system. And the great big mystery is which brick in the whole thing that's holding it back is going to be the weakest link to allow it to start it to erode. Some of these bricks have started to crack historically just in the last few years in the bond market. In 2019, we had the repo crisis. Also in the same year, we had the gilt market meltdown in the UK over the pension fund system. In 2020, we had the big sovereign debt crisis. And in 2023, we've seen some additional structural failures with the bank panic that's been going on. Without a doubt, debt is killing us. We've had record high debt levels and it continues to rise. At present, at the end of the first quarter in 2023, we have over $30 trillion of national debt. That's expected to rise to $34 trillion by the end of the year. Now, to put this into perspective, in 1970, when Volcker had to deal with high inflation, we had... $800 billion worth of debt. So kind of wrap your head around that. We've gone from $800 billion worth of national debt to over $31 trillion in 2023. Also consider that our whole national GDP is $28 trillion versus a national debt of $31 trillion. Basic math says that we simply can't produce enough income even to pay for the interest in the national debt that we currently have. As a reserve currency, the U.S. dollar has to rely on confidence since it's not pegged to a gold standard. I'm not saying that it's ever going to fall out of favor as a reserve currency, but here's an analogy. You've got a fine bottle of Cabernet, and over time, if you take a swimming pool of water and you pour it into that Cabernet, it's going to lose not only its flavor, but its favor. And I would submit that you have to keep watch so that the world stage doesn't look to the U.S. currency without favor or without flavor. So let's go back to the analogy of a pyramid scheme. What we do know is they all end badly. The real issue is that pyramid schemes, they can't taper. They just end. And there's typically a lot of pain involved. So in modern monetary policy, since 1971, we issue basically IOUs with GDP that won't cover it. And it's not politically correct to tax to raise money to pay for it, so we just continue to print money. I'm not saying this will happen, but the only entity that has control over monetary policy and inflation is the central bank. So don't shoot the messenger, but historically speaking, inflation leads to currency debasement, which leads to social unrest, which leads to extreme control and centralized monetary policy. If you look at history where this has happened, and I'm not saying this is happening, but it's pretty sobering to review it, Napoleon in France, it started with inflation. Mussolini in Italy started with inflation. Hitler in Germany started with inflation. Then you take Latin American countries, Chile, Peru, Venezuela. They all started with inflation, which led to currency debasement, which led to social unrest, 
which led to extreme control and centralized monetary policy. So it is vitally important that we get inflation under control. It has more than just monetary implications. It has social implications attached to it as well. So what's the main reason we bring this up? It's to mainly educate yourself to what's going on in the market right now. Try not to look at the talking heads out there that are politicizing every monetary change that we have. Educate yourself on what's going on in the bond market. It is the most honest reflection of what's going on out there right now. So now after all the negative implications, there's always things that we can do. There are always opportunities when you have this transitionary time. By the way, if you're enjoying the content, be sure and like and hit the subscribe button. And I always feel that the video can't be complete without something about what we can do during this time. And there are always opportunities. Number one, and I'll say this every time, take this opportunity to educate yourself. I've given you a few indicators today. Take a look at these markets that are more honest indicators of what's going on instead of listening to the talking heads that are coming out of, you know, the East Coast. Number two, control what you can. Don't worry about what you can't control. Number three, start something you can control. Would you believe that during the last 10 years, there's only been an incremental increase of 10% in wage growth in corporate America? That means if you're ever going to do anything, you're going to have to take the reins by yourself. Sure, it's risky, but I can tell you that the rewards far outweigh just being another number out there waiting for a shoe to drop somewhere. Number four, I would say make sure that you're investing in real assets. In my particular space, it happens to be real estate. And that goes along with uh, the last is the ability to evaluate. Be able to evaluate those opportunities that are coming down the pike right now. Not saying that they're, they're presently, but unless you prepare yourself currently, you're not going to have the ability to act quickly when those opportunities present themselves. And if you're interested in learning about any of those evaluation tools for the coming transition and transference of wealth, reach out to me and mention Axia Solutions, and we'll be glad to get you some information. Hey, thanks again for your time. We appreciate you joining us. Be kind to somebody today, and we'll see you next time.